Hi everybody, my name is Jacob Wisniewski and I am research software engineer at MI Square Data Lab and a student at Warsaw University of Technology. And today I'll be presenting my joint work with Przemysław Wieczek, which is Air Package Fair Models. Fair Models is a flexible tool for bias detection, visualization and mitigation. Now let's answer the question, why should we even care about algorithmic fairness? Well, Decision-making systems and machine learning models had a history of discrimination and somewhat shady practices. For example, ProPublica found that the software used across the United States to find whether someone would be a recidivist or not was biased against blacks. In gender shades, the researchers found that the popular gender classifiers were biased against darker females. The algorithms performed best on light male faces and the gap of accuracy was as high as 30%. As The Verge reported, Google removed gorillas from the, uh, the training sets of images because the model was prone to categorize black people as gorillas. So as you can see, there are many potential harms to be made and it is necessary to test our models before we put them into production. Now, let's define, define this bias because it can have many meanings, but in this presentation and in this fairness field, we'll define it as some discrimination of some groups of people giving unfair advantage to others. From now on, I will call, call those groups of people subgroups, and one of them, the one with the most advantage, would be called privileged subgroup. The vector of indicators of membership to those subgroups will be called protected vector. Bias can be detected by some non-discrimination criteria, which are independence, separation and sufficiency. Essentially, they are trying to answer the question if the response of the model or the target of the model is independent of some protected vector or independent given some condition. But this mathematical way of measuring bias is inconvenient and we'll use some relaxations and sometimes equivalence of those discrimination criteria. We can do this with some fairness metrics. Those metrics can be derived from confusion matrices for each subgroup. So with a well-known metrics like true positive rate, false positive rate, precision, accuracy, we can now detect bias. For example, like in ProPublica case, we would like our model to have uh, similar false positive rates for both black and white defendants. The backbone of fair models is Dalek package, which is a wrapper around the data and model, and it is model agnostic, so it does not matter if you use, if you use XGBoost models from Caret or MLR. Fair models focuses on group fairness metrics and it utilizes this iterative accumulative approach where after obtaining a model, you can make a fairness check. You then receive the answer if your model is fair or not. If your model does not pass the fairness check, you have some options. For example, use different data, use different model, or maybe use some mitigation techniques. With fair models, you can, for example, make a dozen of machine learning models, then make some visualizations uh, where you can pick the best one and check if this model passes fairness check. As you can see, this sort of pipeline or model development flow is easy for testing and prototyping your solutions. Now, we'll dive into the details. Let's take general credit data where we, where we aim to predict whether some person will, be, will have a good or bad risk of credit in this case, this is a binary classification. And we will be looking at bias and fairness with perspective of this protected vector, which is the gender or sex of the person. So let's start with a simple classification model, which will be logistic regression. The next step is to make a Dalek explainer. This can be done with one line of code where we pass the model, the data and the numerical target. Now we are ready to check fairness. The main function of fair models is fairness check. It wraps around and encapsulates explainer 
protected vector and privileged subgroup, which describes which element of the protected vector is suspected of the most privilege. A function returns object of type f object or fairness object, but will assign this fairness object to this variable. The f object can of course be plotted. It includes five metric scores depicted by the bars, which are on top of the red and green areas. The area symbolizes the field. The red area symbolizes the field where the bias is significant. So intuitively, when all the bars are lying within the green area, then the model in terms of these metrics can be called fair. The border between red and green area can be adjusted with epsilon parameter. On y-axis, the subgroups are presented, and for each subgroup, the, metric, the metrics are calculated. If there would be more than one subgroup, there would be more bars for this metric. So the protected vector doesn't have to be binary. It can have many, many values. Or categorical values or, or, or some levels. But what are those values on x-axis? Well, let's dive deeper. The idea behind those values is the ratio of the metrics for unprivileged subgroup, which in our case is female, and the privileged subgroup, which in our case is male. We don't care if the metrics are high or, or, or low, as long as the ratio of them is close to one. For example, let's take equal opportunity ratio which can be measured by true positive rate. When those true positive rate scores are close to one, then they would be lying within green area and we would say that there is no visible bias here. So formally speaking, we would like our ratio to be within epsilon and one divided by epsilon, where epsilon is some value between zero and one, which denotes the lowest possible ratio between unprivileged and privileged subgroups. Now, let's understand some code behind this fairness object. The values after the privileged parameter are the default values for this function. The epsilon parameter is on default set to four-fifths due to a guideline set by Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Generally, any selection rate below 80% or four-fifths can be considered as adverse impact. Cutoffs and labels can also be adjusted. Labels have to be unique for each explainer in fairness check. With such a newly created fairness object, we of course can plot it and print it. Printing is a way of summarizing the plot. The print method shows how many metrics does the model pass, and it also shows the total loss of the model, which is summarized height of the bars. A cool feature of fair models is that you can incrementally add explainers to fairness object. Notice that when we pass fairness object, we don't have to provide any protected vector or privileged parameters because they are already included in the object. On the fairness check plot on the right, we can see green green bar areas added, which denote the ranger metrics for this female subgroup. It passes all of them, so in this print method, it will be printed with green colors. If the ranger would exceed more than one acceptable metric score, it would be printed in red. Sometimes there is a need to plot unscaled metric scores, which aren't the ratios we have seen earlier, but the raw metric scores of the models in specific subgroups. On the plot legend, we have colors and shapes. Each color describes a model and each shape describes certain subgroup. You might ask, where is this male privileged subgroup? Well, it is represented by those red vertical lines. So the intuition behind this plot is that the closer the shapes are, to those vertical lines, the better. In some visualizations, parity loss is used. 
It is a custom function that aggregates some metric ratios over all of the subgroups. So, for example, let's take a true positive rate and calculate its parity loss. The intuition behind this, this method is that the bigger the difference between the metrics in the subgroups, the larger the parity loss will be. These are some other visualizations that use parity loss, and they can be obtained with a code snippets below the plots. Those are only two of many visualizations that can be used in fair models. On the left side, there is a rudder plot, and on the right side, there is a stacked metrics plot. They both visualize the amount of bias in many metrics at the same time. In the package, there are also some simple bias mitigation strategies, which can be used during a data pre-processing and after we create a model with explainer, explainer post-processing. The resampling focuses on statistical parity mitigation. It duplicates or removes observations given some condition. The reject option based classification pivot is a post-processing method that adjusts the probabilistic response of the model. When unprivileged subgroup is close to the cutoff, it pivots to the other side. The opposite thing happens when the privileged subgroup is on the right side of, of the cutoff. You can see the effects of mitigation on the plot on the right. Both methods successfully mitigate the bias in our model. Somewhat new addition to fair models is the support for regression type models. It works just like the one for classification, but instead of using fairness check, user must use fairness check regression. This experimental module is using using logistic regression to approximate fairness non-discrimination notions. The model, module is relatively new and still awaits some feedbacks, so if you use it, please let me know what do you think. To dive deeper into the concepts of fairness in fair models, I recommend visiting fair models landing page available at this link. There are many sources to choose from, including articles, blogs, documentation, and tutorials. You can also visit our blog, which focuses on responsible machine learning, so things like explainability, new packages, case studies, and there is even a whole series about basics of explainable AI. If you want to explain the behavior of your model, and understand on what grounds does it make the decisions, you can check out Dalek package where there is also fair models in Python implemented as Python package Daleks module. That will be all for me. Thank you for the attention. I hope that I gave you some intuition and basic understanding of fair models. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Thank you. So, thanks a lot, Jakub. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, so, the first one would be, is the origin of the bias from the methods of collecting data, or was it the data that were biased themselves? Uh, well, there are many origins of the bias. <clears throat> uh, I once saw the paper that found as many as 20 of them, uh, and it can be uh, obtained or, or um, it can leak to the data uh, on, 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 many, uh, on many stages, for example, in the data collection or in this state, uh, while depicting the state of the world that uh, we don't want to propagate, um, or for example, while uh, data labeling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the, um, the bias can be uh, picked uh, along uh, along the road, I guess. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, another question that we got from Andy um, is the following. What would be the advantages or disadvantages of measuring the fairness against all cases rather than against only the privileged group? Is there a way to automatically detect the privileged group beyond picking um, the larger class? Uh, okay, great question. Uh, I guess there is not like this uh, automatical way implemented, but you can uh, iterate through every class, see if the, uh, this bias exists. Uh, it can be, uh, this numerical values can be accessed through the fairness object. So there is, um, there is a nice way to do it. So, so I guess, yeah, it can be like iterated through each subgroup. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have more time for, for another question. Um, so just keep them coming. We also have time after all the talks to, to answer more questions. So I see another question. Um, what happens if the mitigation is done in a biased way? How do you check or how do we check if the changes fix the biases or result in introducing more bias? Uh, another great, great question. Well. Uh, <laughs> I guess that in, in terms of these five metrics um, that can be uh, th that you can you saw on the fairness check, uh, you can always like plot it after the mitigation to see if the bias uh, indeed mitigated or there were some um, other biases introduced. Uh, you have to also keep in mind that while uh, while using this bias mitigation methods, uh, you also affect the accuracy or, or the performance of your model. So it, it will most likely decrease. Mm -hmm. It is not always uh, what we are looking for, uh, but it also can be uh, visualized in for models. Nice, and thanks a lot, and we can get back to more questions. I see there's more coming and I also have some questions for, for later, I guess. Okay. Um, but now let's hand over to Liz again to, to introduce our second speakers. <laughs> yes, our next talk is about double ML or uh, double machine learning in R. So it fits very well that we have two presenters. Uh, Philip Bach. and Malta Kurz from the University of Hamburg. They're gonna talk about the estimation of causal parameters by machine learning applied to a wide variety of models. And let's see what they have to say. Welcome everybody to our talk on the WML package for R. We are Malta Kurz and Philipp Bach from University of Hamburg. And pre we present this project, which is joint work with Viktor Shemezukov and Martin Spindler. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of USR 2021 for inviting us to present uh, on our R package. Today, I'm going to start with an introduction to the double machine learning framework, which is the statistical framework for our package. Later, Malte is going to uh, provide some insights to our implementation in R. Let's start with this basic question. What is double machine learning? In some sense, double machine learning can be considered as a combination of the strengths of two separate fields. On the one hand side, we have the literature on machine learning, which is illustrated here on the, uh, by the box on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have a box which stands for the literature in the fields of econometrics and statistics. Whereas in machine learning, powerful tools have been developed that are able to deliver very, very accurate prediction rules, such as lasso or regression trees or random forest, the statistics and econometrics literature has developed various approaches to causal inference and also delivered 
asymptotic analysis of certain estimators of causal parameters. The double machine learning framework makes it possible to estimate causal parameter and thereby base estimation on these powerful machine learning techniques. As a result, the procedure is going to output an estimator that has nice statistical properties, such as an asymptotically normal distribution. And um, we can set up hypothesis test and confidence intervals. On the next slide, we have listed some examples on when causal machine learning might be of interest. For example, when uh, data scientists perform and evaluate A-B testing, when researchers evaluate clinical studies, or maybe in political science or economics, uh, when certain policy measures are evaluated. The general question is underlying all these uh, research agendas is what is the effect of a certain treatment on a variable of interest? Let's continue with a short example on a partially linear regression model. In this model, we are interested in the causal effect of a variable D on the outcome Y, provided we control for some confounding variable axis. And this, this way of controlling for these confounding variables can be very general. In this model, we are interested in the parameter theta, which represents this causal effect. When we want to estimate this causal effect by using machine learning methods, we have to be very careful in general because machine learning methods, they generally introduce some form of regularization and thereby some bias. If we naively apply machine learning procedures to estimate the parameter of interest, in the, for example, in a partial linear regression model, um, the, the resulting estimator might be severely biased and also have a non-normal asymptotic distribution. In the histograms below, we have illustrations of two separate naive approaches. One is based on the lasso, on the lasso variable selection step, and on the second one is based on naively plugging in predictions obtained from random forest. In both these um, histograms, we see that the empirical distribution of the estimators is very, very different from a normal density, which is illustrated by the red solid line. The double machine learning framework is a general approach for estimation of treatment effects based on machine learning estimators. Identification of the parameter of interest is based on a moment condition with a score function psi, some data w, and a nuisance term eta that has population or true value eta naught. The double machine learning approach can be generally summarized in terms of three key ingredients. The first one is name on orthogonality, the second one is the use of high quality machine learning estimators. And the third one is the use of sample splitting. Let's turn to the first ingredient, Neyman orthogonality. Neyman orthogonality is a property of the score function that is used for identification. The idea is that the moment condition that is used for identification of the causal parameter um, tolerates some small errors in estimation of the nuisance bar eta around its true value eta naught. In some sense, the estimation procedure is now immunized against these first order or regularization biases that will result from using machine learning estimators. In the partial linear regression example we saw before, we can establish orthogonality by including an additional regression step. Here, if we include the first stage relationship, which is a regression of the treatment variable D in all covariates X, we can achieve, or we can get the name and orthogonal score that has the form below, which now has two nuisance components. The first one is the function G showing up in the main regression equation, and the M comes from the first stage step. 
let's go to the second key ingredient, which is the use of uh, high quality machine learning estimates. So in general, we want to use, of course, uh, very, very accurate um, machine learning methods for estimation of our nuisance part eta. In theoretical terms, this amounts to a rate requirement and the rate of, of convergence associated for, with the estimators in use. Um, in practice, when we think about the use of machine learning methods, we will base this on structural assumptions. For example, whenever we are willing to make an assumption of sparsity, we won't maybe use some L1 penalized estimator like Lasso. The third ingredient is the use of sample splitting, which is common procedure in um, machine learning. Sample splitting avoids biases that arise from overfitting. So in the algorithm of the double machine learning estimator, we fit the machine learning methods only on one part of the data, the training sample. We generate prediction on uh, the holdout sample, which is a test sample. And then we can swap the roles, which is called then cross-fitting. By swapping the roles, we can uh, basically use every observation in the data set once for training and once for fitting. Once we obtain these predictions by this procedure, we can plug them in into the score and solve our target parameter. Theta. Once we include all these three ingredients, and under some regularity assumptions, it can be shown that the uh, double machine learning estimator theta tilde naught is asymptotically normally distributed. For more details involved, uh, and this is why we refer to the paper by Shannon Zukov and co-authors 2018, and also in our package vignette, which is available online, where we have additional and a more extensive introduction to the double machine learning framework. To conclude our partial linear regression simulation example, we included here now the two, the two histograms that are associated with the machine learning estimators based on Lasso and Random Forest, where we use now orthogonal score um, and sample splitting. And we see that the empirical distribution is now much more similar to the normal density that is illustrated by the red solid line. That was the theory part, and now I hand over to Malte. Yeah, thank you, Philip. After we have now learned what, uh, how this double machine learning framework works, uh, we now want to have a closer look at the actual implementation in the R package called double ML. We have just uh, learned what are the three key ingredients of double machine learning, namely the orthogonal score, high quality machine learning methods, and sample splitting. And these three key ingredients also translate to the central parts of our implementation. So the orthogonal score gets a central role via an object-oriented implementation using R6 classes. And we also want to provide the user the ability to use high quality machine learning methods. This is achieved by um, having the API flexible um, with regards to using all the machine learning methods that are available via the MLR3 ecosystem. And also sample splitting is needed. And here we also build on top of MLR3. So we have just learned the main dependencies of our double ML R package are the MLR3 ecosystem in terms of the MLR3 package, the MLR3 learners, and the MLR3 tuning package. Besides that, for um, object orientation, we need the R6 package. And as a data backend, we use uh, for efficient data search, we use data table. How could you install or get our package? Um, it is um, available or we release it to CRAN, so you can install it via the standard command and the development version is available through GitHub. So why did we actually uh, choose to implement this in an object-oriented fashion? So we, we have learned that this name and orthogonal score function is having a prominent role. And if we have defined this name and orthogonal score function for a model we are interested in, we can implement a lot of things in a, in a very general way. 
So if we have defined this uh, score function, we can, for example, implement the estimation of orthogonal parameters, the computation of the score function, estimation of standard errors or confidence intervals, and also a multiplier bootstrap in a general way, just using the score function. And this is then actually done in an abstract base class called double ML. And from this, we can then inherit all the model classes. So the only model specific parts are then how this score function is actually implemented and which new resource models uh, we have to estimate using ML methods. And um, coming to what models uh, classes do we have? So um, we have, uh, or Philip introduced to us the partially linear regression model we see here on the left. Um, but we also have other model classes. So at the moment, we have four different models. And for example, if you want to add an instrumental variable to your partially linear regression models, you can use the partially linear IB regression model. Or if you are interested in heterogeneous treatment effects, we have also interactive regression models. And all those model classes are inherited from the double ML abstract base class and you can then for example also extend that by adding other model classes so what is the uh, what are the main advantages of this object oriented implementation of double ml so first of all it, it gives the user a high very high flexibility uh, with regards to the model special a specification. So you can throw in all the different ML methods you uh, might want to use for estimating your new resource functions. You can uh, alter the resampling scheme. So how many folds are you using? How many re um, repetitions are you using for the repeated cross-fitting? You can uh, choose among two different uh, DML algorithms and you can also choose among different name and orthogonal score functions. A second uh, key advantage uh, is that this, uh, uh, our package double ML is easily uh, extendable. So you can add new model classes by inheriting from this um, uh, central uh, abstract base class double ML, but you can, for example, also um, add um, other resampling schemes. Last, I uh, want to quickly advertise uh, our online resources. So we have a website, doubleml.org. There you find like an extensive user guide and uh, a lot of examples, but you can also, for example, see there that we have uh, a Python twin. So if you are not only interested in R, but also sometimes use Python, uh, that's also available there. And in addition, we of course have like a package vignette, which is available as an archive uh, working paper. And with that, I'd like to conclude and want to thank you for watching this video. And we are looking forward um, to the discussions in, at the USR conference. And as we have a bit of time left, I want to quickly show you, we have two, uh, two papers available for the two different packages. And uh, on our website, you, for example, also fin find things like a, the double ML workflow. It's basically showing you how, for a, a data example, you can use uh, the double ML package and it basically guides you through the steps, the important steps to do to use double ML for causal machine learning. Thank you. So thanks a lot, both of you. Um, we're still waiting for questions. So please, everyone, type your questions. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to say, like, really, I really like your uh, the logo <laughs> of your package. I, I would also like to know how you came up with that. Um, but I can also start with a question um, on your talk. So. At the end, you said that uh, double ML is really easily extendable to to other um, models or all kinds of models. Um, did you get any like feedback from people who tried to extend it um, and made good experiences with that? So I think I can take this one. Right? Um, yes, we already got some feedback, and of course, I mean the paper by Viktor Shenazukov on double machine learning, it's pretty general and it's a very general approach. So it's, I think, pretty common as statistical framework that it's uh, first developed in a very general way. And um, practitioners have to kind of adjust 
the details according to their analysis, right? So you have to cluster standard errors, for example, or you have to um, kind of, I don't know, you want to take some some extension, some slight modification, you want to trim your propensity scores and all these little things that you have to tune and uh, to parameterize in your analysis. And I think this is the part like uh, we are currently developing the package and uh, we are going to integrate more and more of these kind of um, yes, uh, details that are more relevant or like they're not details in analysis, but they're like relevant if you really work on a particular application. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so I see there's quite some questions coming in. Um, and there's also one of the questions that I actually had from, from Andy Pryke. Um, were there particular real world applications uh, which inspired you to do this work? Um, so we have some kind of experience. So we are here to chair statistics and we already have some experience with using uh, like basically lasso based methods for causal inference in practice. So, and then the natural development or extension was generalizing it to this double machine learning approach where you basically can use any kind of learner. And then of course we're curious and want to find out if, if, if everything works well. And yes, and then this is how we got to this problem. So actually it was kind of, uh, of course, driven because we wanted to uh, use all these machine learning stuff in applications. Great. Um, I see a more like provocative question <laughs> uh, from Carlo, I guess. Um, you're combining machine learning and statistics. Do you, do you want to conquer the world? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> you can help me out on this. <laughs> so we don't have plans to conquer the world. We just want to, I don't know, uh, try to combine these to different literatures because they are of course relevant. And I mean, on one hand side, the machine learning literature is developing very, very quickly. On the other sa side, um, there is more and more happening in causal inference and there are more causal models uh, appearing and that stuff. So I think conquering the world, it's like the super, super big goal, even like keeping up with the pace of publications, <laughs> this is kind of a <laughs> still challenging, uh, Goal. So I think, yeah, I don't know. We try to 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 be productive at all. <laughs> maybe that's a good answer. Yeah, maybe we can come back to this uh, after after the last talk. Um, so I invite Liz again to present our last speaker. Thank you for the questions. Our next speaker is Jan Ma from Tsinghua University in Beijing. And he is going to talk to us about uh, his package called CAPENT. Um, it's for en estimating copula entropy and transfer entropy in R. So let's see what he has to say. Hello, users. I'm Ma Jian. I got my PhD from Tsinghua University, major in computer science. The title of my talk is Copent, Estimating Copula Entropy and Transfer Entropy in R. In this talk, I will introduce the package Copent, a package for estimating copula entropy and transfer entropy. This work is part of my PhD thesis. The Copen package was first developed during my PhD study. This is the content of my talk. In this talk, I will first give a brief introduction on background of copula entropy. Next, I will introduce the implementation of the package. Two examples will be followed next, one on wearable selection, the other on casual discovery. Finally, summary and some information. First, introduction. Statistical independence and conditional independence are two fundamental concepts in statistics with many applications. Copula entropy is a mathematical concept for multivariate statistical independence, which I proposed during my PhD study. 
I also propose a non-parametrical method for estimating it in my PFD sizes. Transfer entropy is a tool for measuring casualty. It generalizes the famous grand casualty for nonlinear cases. Recently, I proved it can be represented with only CE, and therefore can also be estimated non-parametrically via CE. The Copen package in R implements the above method for estimating CE and TE. This talk introduces the implementation of the package and then compares it with the other related packages. This slide is for Coppola theory. Coppola theory is about the representation of multivariate dependence with the so-called Coppola function. At the core of the theory is the Scott theorem as shown on the slide. With the Coppola theory, we give the definition and the theorem in the theory of Coppola entropy. We first define Coppola entropy, a type of Shannon entropy defined with Coppola density function. We then prove the equivalence between mutual information and the Coppola entropy. The theorem states that mutual information is actually negative Coppola entropy. The difference is that mutual information is defined for bivariate cases and Coppola entropy is for multivariate cases. Coppola entropy is an ideal measure for statistical independence with several good properties that the other measures don't have, such as multivariate, symmetric, non-negative, equals zero if and only if in the independent cases, invariant to monotonic transformation, and equivalent to traditional correlation coefficient in Gauss cases. The table on the slide compares Coppola entropy with two other famous measures, distance correlation and HSIC. We can see that Coppola entropy has several advantages over the other two. This slide forms the method for estimating CE. As is well known, estimating mutual information is considered as notoriously difficult. Here we propose a method for estimating mutual information or Coppola entropy based on the theorem just mentioned. It's simply an elegant, composed of two simple steps. First, estimating empirical Coppola density function with rank statistic. Then the problem became an entropy estimation problem. Among the valuable methods, we propose to use KN method for estimating entropy. Because both steps are non-parametric, so the final method is non-parametric. It has several advantages as shown on the slide. Please refer to the paper on the slide if interested in more details. This slide for estimating transfer entropy. The transfer entropy is an important concept for marrying casualty. It is essentially conditional independent testing. It has wide applications in different fields. However, estimating it is also difficult, just as mutual information. Recently, I proved that transfer entropy can be represented with only C, as shown in the equation 5. Transfer entropy equals to three C terms. With this representation, we propose a non-parametric method for estimating transfer entropy, composed of two simple steps. First, estimating the three terms in the equation 5, and then calculating TE from the estimated C terms. After the theory, this slide is for an overview of Copan package. It implements the method for estimating Coppola entropy and transfer entropy. The latest version is 0 0.2 and includes five functions, as you see on the slides. I will introduce them one by one. This slide is for the three functions for estimating Coppola entropy. The method for estimating Coppola entropy composed of two steps, so we have two functions for each step. Construct empirical Coppola is for estimating empirical Coppola density, and ENT-KN implements the KN method for estimating entropy. 
Here, for estimating coupled entropy from empirical coupled density from the first step. And the main function, copent, is with two line codes calling for about two functions. For user's convenience, the copent function returns negative coupled entropy. CE is a function of testing conditional independence. It's simple, just estimating three C, C terms and calculating the result. Transcend is the function for estimating TE. It is also simple, just preparing the date according to the argument lag, which is for time lag, and then calling for the function CI, because transfer entropy is essentially conditional independence. Now let's demonstrate the usage of the package with examples. The first example is on variable selection. The paper and the code for this example are listed at the bottom of the slides. Variable selection with the coupled entropy is simply to select variables based on the rank of the association between variable and the target measured by coupled entropy. There are several other related measures in R, such as HSIC in DHSIC package, distance correlation in energy package, HHG test in the HHG package, Hoffman's D test and the Bugsma Dicel's T star sign covariance in the independent package, and ball correlation in the ball package. We will compare them in this example. The date used here is the heart disease date in the UCI machine learning depository. It contains four databases, including 899 samples without missing values. And each sample has 76 sam attributes, of which the number 58 is for diagnosis and the 13 attributes of them are recommended by the professionals as clinical relevant. The goal of the example is to select attributes for predicting diagnosis. We load data from the UCI server directly with the code on the slide. Here is the main code for the example. We call the functions for all the measures in the R packages. With this code, we estimate the dependence between the attributes number 58 and the other attributes. This slide shows the figures for the selection result with the six measures. The red line in each sub-figure is for the dependence between number 58 and the number 16 attributes, which is the selection threshold for each measure. This slide for the interpretability of the selections we compare the selections with the recommended variables to check the number of the selected recommended variables. We see that coupled entropy selects more than the other measures did. Next is the example on casual discovery. The paper and the code for this example are listed at the bottom of the slides. Casual discovery is to infer casualty from observational data. Here we will infer casualty by estimating transfer entropy with the Copen package. There are also other R packages, including kernel-based conditional independence in the candy indie tests package, conditional distance correlation in the CDCSIS package and the conditional dependence coefficients in the FOCI package. The data used here is the Beijing PM 2.5 data, also from the UCI depository, containing the hourly observation lasting five years. It has several meteorological factors. In this example, we use the pressure factor to avoid the meeting value, we use only a part of continuous observation, including 501 samples. Here is the main code of the example. We estimate the casual strength from pressure to PM 2.5 in 1 hour to 24 hours. We first prepare the data according to the lag hours and then call the function for each measure. 
For transfer entropy, we have two ways of doing the job. We can call the function transcend directly, or we can call the function CI with the prepared date. This slide shows estimation results with different measures. We can see that transfer entropy, CDC, and the codec had similar results. Now let me summarize the talk. First, I introduce the background of the Copen package. Then I introduce the implementation of the package. Next, I use two examples to demonstrate the usage of the package and compare it with the other R packages. This slides show the reference for this talk. And this slide shows the software. The Copen package in R and Python are now available on Cron and the PYPI respectively and also on my GitHub. And finally, let me show my luxury car, a golf I named Copla Entropy. I enjoy the power of Copla Entropy on my way to office and also in my office. Copla Entropy really give me a lot of fun every day. I hope you can also enjoy it with the Copen package. Thank you for your listening. Thanks a lot for your talk, Tian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there's no questions from the audience yet, uh, if I mm. say it correctly, but let it come, please. Um, but I can I can start with a question. Um, which one should I choose? <laughs> so, for example, you um, for the variable selection example that you had, um, you you compared different methods or different R packages uh, and and showed the results. And the mm. popular entropy framework selected more variables than, than the others. So do you, is there a reason for that? Um, can you explain that? Mm, I think I, I can explain from mm, theoretically and or practical, practically. Theoretically, I think the, the copula entropy is uh, defined rigorously. It's, uh, uh, I think it's uh, ideal mathematical concept for statistical independence measures and uh, compare with other uh, uh, to, uh, theor theoretical tools, it, uh, I think it had the advantage over others. And for uh, the method estimating those measures, I think our um, estimation method is uh, non-parametrically so it's uh, model free. Uh, it can be applied to any uh, method, and uh, it also take advantage of the uh, copula function, which can make our estimation method uh, uh, more stable and uh, more reliable. So I think I answer your questions from these two aspects. Thank you. Um, yeah, also regarding the same example, um, since you showed or compared these different methodologies, uh, did you also compare the predictive performance of the different um, the models that came out of the different frameworks? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, in uh, another paper I showed in the reference slides, there is a paper titled uh, Variable Selection with Copula Entropy. In that paper, I show more details on these uh, examples. Uh, uh, after we select variables, we uh, compare the predictability of each uh, models and uh, uh, the model built with copper entropy uh, also uh, presents the highest predictability. Great. I, I see a question now from, from Martin Mechler. He also um, gave a comment in the, the questions that you can look at um, that um, they also in the current package copula um, provided or estimated the, the empirical copula. So, and then the, the question is, um, how do you tune the smoothing when estimating the empirical, empirical copula? Uh, uh Estimating empirical copula is very uh, simple. It's just use the rank statistics and divide uh, divided by the sample size. Uh, we got the empirical copula. 
that, that's very simple. Just uh, two or three lines of code, we can done the job. Um, I hope that answers your question, Martin. Otherwise, just uh, ask another one. Um, so we have uh, two more minutes reserved for you. Um, so I can ask another one of my questions. Um, OK, uh, he actually said that uh, he thanks you and found sometimes, um, so we, they found in their package, I guess, that sometimes it needs uh, tuning the smooth uh, yeah. Okay. So you. I don't know if you want to go on with that, but otherwise, my my question would be: so you also uh, implemented your method in in Python. Um, do you see like advantages to R, or or why did you why did you do that? Because I think uh, uh, our estimation method is uh, mature to be applied to more uh, areas. So I have applied it in my uh, projects. Uh, I have applied it to several projects successively. So I think maybe couple entropy can be applied to the much larger uh, Python community. They can use a uh, Copan package. Uh, I may, and also I, I see uh, many uh, Python users have has used my package in their projects. I got many feedbacks from them. That's that's great if it's if it's used. That's that's why mm. you need, I guess. Um, so I believe now we're in the global or um, Q and A part of this session. So I invite all the speakers uh, to come back to the stage and um, switch on their cameras if they want. And I invite all the participants to keep on uh, asking questions, also also in Slack. Um, so, Liz, do you do you have a question that you would like to ask, ask to one of the speakers before I go? Uh, yeah, go go for. Okay. <laughs> go for the. All right. Um, so I hope that I give them now to the right speakers. I, I tried to write it down, but I'm not a hundred percent sure if I take this correctly. Um, so I guess the first one that I would like to ask is goes to Jak Jakub um, from Anastasia. Do you think that unsupervised algorithms can also be biased? Mm, well, I guess so. Uh, I guess it's, uh, it's because we have some data, we make this unsupervised learning, we are uh, for example, clustering uh, something, uh, and we measure the um, the distance, for example, between the clusters. Maybe in such way, uh, but I didn't focus my research on, on, on supervised learning, so I uh, don't know if there are some, for example, like packages and. Uh, maybe more research research methods on this topic thank you also if the other speakers want to jump in that's totally fine um, <laughs> um yeah i think we're going on with with bias so i guess it's also again for Jakub. okay <laughs> um uh, are you testing the biases removed model against a separate data set or can you use cross-validation? Uh, you can use, I guess, some different data. Uh, for example, uh, mm, you may use, like, train train your models on, on training data and, of course, evaluate it on, on the test data. Uh, and you can measure fairness on this test data, of course. Uh, mm, I don't know if it answers your question, but also in fair models, you can just use different, for example, columns or uh, different pre-processed data, et cetera, et cetera, as long as the uh, target variables match. 
and you are predicting the, the, the on the same, for example, uh, set of uh, of people or instances. Yeah, and then, like I said, there's another question for you. Um, is there any particular stage of collecting and analyzing data when we should start paying attention to bias detection? I guess that the, the, um, the most focus should be uh, put on the data gathering and uh, thinking about what what features do we need to uh, get into this data to um, to predict uh, pr to predict the outcome? Maybe uh, some features like uh, the um, gender or um, or, or uh, the place of uh, where does this person live, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and some correlated variables like the zip codes, uh, which may indicate. Mm, where someone is from, uh, I guess this is the this this uh, mm, ex, uh, the setting of the uh, data gathering and this mm, all all the things that you have to do uh, before uh, making your machine learning model. This this is the uh, the most in, uh, important in my opinion. I guess you have to keep it in mind in all stages. Um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks a lot. So yeah. um, I do have a couple more questions anyway. Um, and Liz, just if you have something, just take Are you more. looking on Slack as well? Um, there's, I think, nothing. There's a couple of like people that are interested, which is good. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe Malta and, and Philip, um, can you give us another like real data example where where you applied your methodology? Yes. So what we did to kind of as a as a first test of our package and everything is um, so in the original paper by uh, Viktor Shemzukov where he developed the Dow machine learning approach. So it's two thousand uh, paper 2018 in the econometrics journal. Then he has an application on where you can estimate the causal effect of uh, eligibility or the participation in certain pension plans on your uh, net financial assets. And this is what we rec replicate and we have it online in, on our website. So you can go through all the single steps, how you can estimate. And then you can basically also compare the results to what they have in the paper also data set has been used in other, um, um, in other publications as well. So you can kind of see, like, or can, can find out what's the important part. So do the parameters vary in some way? Do your results change if you use different burners or if you change something, if you use only a subset of the data or anything? So there we have one example. And also we are working on like uh, getting the package run in more and more applications. So we're currently working on this and they will all be like, published. And also we have a vignette where we go through some examples. So in case you are interested in seeing how it works, what the, what's the idea? Because I think in our talk, we're rather general talking about general method. Um, so maybe it's nice to see some like more hands-on example and that's what's available online. So in case you're interested, have a look. It's very good to know. Um, yeah, I would have another question for for Sian. Also regarding applications, maybe um, can you name an application or a case study where a copula entropy, the copula entropy framework, is is favorable to to other methods? You're muted. Sorry. Ah uh, yes. Uh -huh. Uh, let me mention the hydrology. Hydrology. Uh, that, that means the water resources and management. Uh, um, copula entropy is uh, getting more and more popular in that area. 
many uh, researchers in this area apply uh, copper entropy in their uh, problems. So uh, I know one uh, researcher from, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, Lisbon, uh, Lisbon, Portugal. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, Portugal, yeah. Uh, Yes, uh, one researcher from uh, Europe apply our method in their projects uh, uh, to manage uh, uh, resources for, from Brazil. Uh, and also in my country, uh, many uh, researchers from different universities use my uh, couple entropy uh, mm, to design uh, mm, water resources stations network and uh, to uh, many other applications in in this hydro hydro hydrology uh, areas. So I, I know many uh, other areas also apply our methods, uh, but due to the time, I do not want to mention more. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I mean, you can also put some some links maybe on Slack so that we get a better idea um, if you want to. Um, yeah, so there's still no more questions coming in, but now I just uh, dare to ask about this logo. So for this, it's actually two rhinos <laughs> on the logo. And uh, I, I was wondering why, how come? So <laughs> please. <laughs> Very nice question. So it's basically something like a two-headed Reno, right? Uh, yes, it was kind of hard to come up with, an ex with a nice logo that illustrates the idea of the estimator. So the basic idea or the basic challenge was to visualize the double robustness property of the estimator. So we thought of something double and something robust. So <laughs> that's why we did <laughs> Reno as a robust estimator. That's terrific. <laughs> All right, so I actually have one last question for Jakob, um, and then I think we're done, I guess. Um, at one of, on your, one of your first slides, you showed this, um, what I call it, this diagram um, to, to show the different steps of, of getting to a fair model. And there you actually presented the choice of the best model before the fairness check. And I was wondering whether, um, whether this, what, what is the reasoning behind this ordering and whether it would also make sense to actually do the fairness check uh, before testing which model is, is the best? Uh, uh, well, in, in this diagram, uh, mm, there was like, uh, you have to do a fairness check uh, to obtain this fairness object and then you, uh, you can make a, a lot of visualizations on top of that. And uh, my point was uh, that if you have uh, many, many models and some of them, uh, all of them, uh, maybe not pass the, this fairness check, uh, maybe there is some metric or two metrics that are uh, not met, but you may uh, use some visualization techniques to obtain the model with the least amount of bias. So uh, maybe not the uh, this fair model, but the best you can get in this situation, for example, because sometimes there uh, mm, there may be, may be uh, not man, many ways to, to get rid of the bias uh, without sacrificing uh, the predictive power of the model. Okay, so I guess it's kind of a yeah, you have to you kind have of to weigh just, both somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting, nice, perfect. Um, so thanks a lot again to to all the speakers, four speakers um, of this session. Uh, thanks a lot to Stefan, Stefan, sorry, also behind the scene to taking care of the all the technical technical parts of this session and Liz uh, to introduce um, the speakers. So what is up next? So you can enjoy uh, some more social events um, going into trivia, um, which will happen at 3.15 UTC. And then at 4.15 UTC, so um, quite
quite soon, you can enjoy another very exciting joint keynote um, on, on communication. So thanks a lot, all of you, and see you in the next session. I'd also like to mention that if you are interested in the, this topic of modeling and data analysis, there will be another session on uh, 9C will be similar.